I guess I can get started. And yeah, yeah. We're all Please. Here, I guess, for now. All right. Hello. Uh, for the folks that I uh, haven't met, I'm um, Dan Buckstein. Uh, that's my mug. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have a, uh, I have a question. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is uh, wonderful, the wonderful world of shaders. Uh, more of the intro. And uh, it's just data is the theme that I would like you to remember the whole time. Okay, the, those uh, three or four words, depending on if you uh, believe in apostrophes or not. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, Dan Shaderman Buckstein, uh, I used to be called that, believe it or not. Uh, assistant <laughs> professor at Champlain College. Uh, I teach game programming there. Uh, my current courses are graphics and physics. Okay. Um, been a background, uh, MSc, computer science, and uh, BIT in game development and entrepreneurship uh, from a place called UOIT, which is in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, uh, Greater Toronto area. Yes, I'm Canadian. I apologize. Oh, there's lots of Canadians. <laughs> I'm another really Canadian. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry you feel that way. No, no, no. no. <laughs> lost the hockey last night. I'm so upset. And uh, just for fun, I mean, my favorite games are the uh, the original six Dragon Quest, uh, particularly actually the remakes are really well done. Uh, Super Mario 64 and Banjo Kazooie. The latter two have amazing graphics. Like, I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> just like. You know, the ability at the time, like, well, can't believe it. But anyway, so what are we talking about today? Uh, the technical yet cross-discipline perspective. And so, uh, this is not about Unity, Maya, Unreal, whatever. It's just kind of like the general get over the hump. Uh, so if, if we're intimidated by shaders, I really hope uh, that I can convince you and sell you on how much fun they are. Uh, and get me started. Bless you. Okay, so remember, it's just data. The shaders are for everyone. And I'll talk about a few tricks in the trade as well. Okay, uh, how much is there to discuss? Okay, so right here, uh, I don't want to bore you to death, so I'm going to go for about 45 ish minutes uh, in total. Um, the graphics curriculum in game programming at Champlain is approximately 90 to 135 credit hours, depending on how many courses you take. So there's a lot of stuff, hence very quick uh, intro. Okay, so... <laughs> 2011, around this week, uh, <laughs> this is actually the anniversary. <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> Your first shader? I, yeah, I'm not even joking. My first shader, uh, was, it was just the Taurus, and it had the normals. Uh, display this color, okay? And that was my over-the-hump moment. As soon as I saw that on the screen, I was like, whoa. And then it was all downhill from there. But um, I was bored, really. It was uh, a downtime for me. And I just said, you know what? Never done that before. I've heard all about these shader things, and uh, I'm just going to do it. Uh, put something together in C++ using OpenGL. And that's pretty much what my uh, domain has been uh, the whole time. Hello. <laughs> How did the rest of you get here so early? There was severe traffic. Yes. Mm -hmm. What were they yelling about, by the way? I don't even know. Anyway. <laughs> um, OpenGL is complicated. Okay, so this is actually the, uh, uh, the pipeline. Uh, I can post these later. There's a link if you want to go to the PDF of this image and actually zoom in and kind of you know, try and explore this whole thing. Um, but the point of it is that along the way, okay, there's a whole bunch of little uh, stations and the little uh, hubs that the data passes through. Um, in the fixed function pipeline, which is the original way of doing things on the GPU, all of those stations were fixed, hence fixed function. They didn't really let you uh, change anything. The way OpenGL works is there's a million different switches, and you can flick these switches on or off. Uh, some of them do multiple things, and some of them have many different options, so it's like you flick a switch, and then there's like 10 different sub-switches that you have to flick. Um, so people said, uh, let's give people more control uh, at those little islands. So those hubs are what shaders actually are. Uh, they are the programmable in programmable pipeline. So those stops are basically your chance to kind of interfere with the data flow and change it, okay? 
Uh, so we got uh, six different kinds of shaders. Okay, there's one that does not appear there, uh, but I don't want you to forget about it. Okay, we'll put it kind of over there. Uh, uh, basically what happens is uh, the first thought is the vertex shader. Uh, after that, uh, tessellation, so breakdown, uh, followed by another tessellation phase, geometry, fragment. Okay, so the blue stops in this uh, image are some of those switches that you can still flick and uh, play around with. Okay, turn stuff on and off, different tests and what have you. Ultimately, API, so if you're writing C++ or even Unity, which would be responsible for just loading like OBJ files or models or FBX or whatever, uh, that basically says store a bunch of stuff, stuff it on the graphics card and let's show you do the rest. Okay, and then image right at the end. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a, a chain is called a program, so this is the a universal uh, kind of collection of uh, your influence over the data. Okay. So at each stop, uh, again, you have control, and when you put them all together, uh, you get one chance uh, for each, render, uh, each rendered object to manipulate the data. Okay, so some common configurations that we'll see is, uh, <laughs> again, vertex, tessellation, tessellation, geometry, fragment, or vertex, geometry, fragment, or vertex, fragment. This is what uh, you're probably the most familiar with if you have dealt with shaders. It's just vertex data, fragment data at the end. Um, vertex shader by itself, okay, so you don't even need a fragment shader, and you're like, damn, what the hell? How do you do color? You don't have a fragment shader. Well, that's where CS, which stands for compute shader, this is like the new big thing, is general purpose GPU. Uh, compute shader is basically uh, do whatever the hell you want, but that's got to be alone in the corner. That's kind of why I put it over here. Like, don't forget about me. I'm still here, but uh, I don't really fit in anywhere in that pipeline. Okay. Um, So I'll get into more details about those. Okay, so well-known languages, we've probably heard of uh, many of these. Uh, CG, C for graphics, RIP. Okay, I'm pretty sure they're not really doing anything with it anymore um, since uh, you know, DirectX 12 has recently come out. Uh, and especially with Vulkan being introduced in the field, basically the successor to OpenGL, uh, which is still around. To my own surprise, in last June, uh, GLSL 4.6 was released. Okay, and I was like, that's never going to happen. 4.5 is the end uh, because Vulkan has taken over and they're never going to do anything with OpenGL. And then they're like, 4.6 is out. I'm like, what? What did they do? So they actually said, uh, we're bringing some Vulkan support into OpenGL. So kind of going the other way. Uh, so if you're using OpenGL 4.6, you actually have a little piece of Vulkan in there. So it brings OpenGL a little closer to the metal, uh, not Apple metal, uh, <laughs> right, metal right? But uh, that's pretty much what they did. Okay? So metal uh, is Apple's proprietary uh, shading language, works on Apple and only Apple, and Vulkan works on everything except for Apple. Okay? So there's your, your polar, right? Um, so, how many people have used at least two of these? Three. <coughs> Usually that's not the case. I don't know, what, do they, what do they use in Unity, like when you open up their shape? So, Unity, Unity does uh, HLSL yeah, okay. and GLSL. Uh, they, they also kind of wrap everything in their own little, like, higher level language. So it's like Unity shading language or Shader something. Labs. Yeah. And, uh, all they really do is kind of uh, give you the the real you know plug-in points to these languages. It's like, what do you need? Uh, the semantics. They give you kind of a layout for uh, the stuff the graphics card will recognize if you use it. Okay. Um, so it's really Unity kind of does their own thing as well. And it looks like this, but uh, it's not actually. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This is very important. Okay. Um, this, is, this is why people are intimidated, because uh, you see all the stuff going on, 
Um, and there's so much set up to do, right? As a, as a tools programmer, uh, I always remind my students that there is a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of moving parts and you have to be very careful. It's, it's actually, like I've never performed surgery before, but I imagine it's kind of like computer surgery, you know? Like you have to make sure that all the little numbers are set to the right thing, uh, plugged into the right place, and make sure that everything's kind of wired together correctly in order for uh, anything to work. Otherwise, you just see black on the screen, there's nothing there. And, or whatever was there last frame, it just kind of freezes. If you're doing a buffer swap, you'll see kind of a <laughs> seizure, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, you'll, you might actually see that here, because uh, uh, I'll show you something later, but the one rule to rule them all is, say it with me folks, it's just data, data. <laughs> right? Okay, you have to remember that. A shader program eats raw data, okay? okay? Again, the API defines the geometry, stores in what's called a vertex buffer that looks kind of like this, okay? Confusing point number one, you have data that's interleaved every time it repeats itself, so every time the pattern repeats, that's a vertex. Okay, so one vertex is like a collection of different attributes as they're called, so uh, example attributes are position, so like where in space is it, so people commonly refer to vertices as the positions, the position is not vertex, position is part of a vertex. Okay. Vertex is like a nice little box of data, and you look into the box and you've got to tell the shader what the data actually is, right? So like that first thing there, that's going to be position, the second thing there, that's going to be normal, the third thing there, it's going to be UVs, okay? I hope I'm not speaking a different language right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> Again, sort of high level, broad, right? But uh, uh, the vertex shader only reads this as you tell it to. So you have to be very specific. And again, I'll show you what happens if you misalign your specification. Okay. Uh, it also outputs raw data. So believe it or not, we commonly think of the output as an image. Well, guess what? You can read that image. And what if we draw off screen? So if we have what's called a frame buffer, we can basically draw over here a separate little invisible box and then read from it and throw that onto the back buffer, which is what you're actually looking at, right? Well, actually, what you're looking at right now is the front buffer. So if you have a double buffered situation, front is for display, back is for drawing. That's like your main canvas. And then every update, you just swap them. Okay, and then you get this kind of cycle. It goes really fast. Uh, that's why if you're not doing something right, you might see the jittery uh, last frame this frame, last frame, this frame, because it's cycling, okay? Uh, and we do that by uh, rendering a full screen quad. So two triangles is plastered right up there on the screen. Uh, your fragment shader would be responsible from reading, or responsible for reading from one of these textures and coloring as fragments are generated. Those little cells that you saw would be examples of fragments. Okay, so you kind of see where I'm going here with the whole vertex fragment. We've seen those as shaders before. Okay, um, the shaders are really just fancy data readers and writers. Okay, they're crazy fast and they don't give a damn. <laughs> okay, so here are some of my uh, most recent escapades. I was trying to do uh, skinning. Uh, and because of a huge miscommunication with the GPU that resulted in my uh, monster model just turning into a monstrosity. <laughs> Not the monster that I expected, a different kind. But, um, so that's really what you have to remember. It really is just data, okay? And that's why you have to kind of make sure that you know what the data is, because miswiring it will confuse the hell out of you. Not really your GPU, it's like, whatever man, you told me to do that. Enjoy, here you go, right? Uh, so what do they do? Uh, the misnomer is that a shader does not actually shade, okay? Unless you really tell it to, that's not inherently its job. 
to you know make lighting look real pretty and stuff. But no, no, they do anything you want them to. You have to tell them what to do. But uh, the true purpose is to take the data and manipulate it, as I said. So each stop along the pipeline has a certain uh, responsibility. Okay, so the vertex shader is responsible for opening up that initial box that you define in the C, C++ side of things, or Unity loaded model. Okay, open the box, take a look at what you got, and pass that along. Okay, you, can, you can do whatever you want to that data while it's in the vertex phase, but you have to remember that that data came from <coughs> the API. Along the line, you get a uh, level of detail and opportunity to uh, tessellate your data, which is like subdivide it, so you can take excuse me, a triangle, make it into many triangles, and this one's cool because you can tell it how many times you want to run. So instead of just going through to the next thing, it'll actually loop back and do it again and again and again until you say, okay, that's enough. Then, every single triangle that is produced from these two stages goes to the geometry shader. I like to think of it as a multiple vertex shader, because it really is. It processes multiple vertices at the same time, hence a triangle is three vertices, a point would be one, uh, a line would be two, okay? And there's other options like uh, triangle adjacent, so you can actually manipulate uh, a triangle and its neighbors at the same time. Think of the, uh, the triforce symbol. It literally hands you a triforce and says, <laughs> deal with that, okay? Uh, fragment is responsible for outputting to the, frag, uh, the frame buffer, so basically apply color. You can also manipulate depth if you really want to. So your Z buffer, uh, you can also shift that value. Just one number, you can say, nah, I'm going to make it closer, I'm going to make it further, or I'm just going to throw it away. I don't want that. You can do whatever you want pertaining to each stage of the pipeline. Okay. How are we doing so far? Good. Good? Yeah. Yes. Right. Are you going to describe what a fragment is the same way you describe what a vertex is? Uh, I can if you like. If you're not going to, yeah, I'd love to. No, for sure. I'd love you to sure. break that open. Absolutely, absolutely. So between here and here, so after the geometry phase, uh, when you're dealing with geometry, you're still like at the raw triangle, um, you know, mentality, right? It's, it's a vector shape. It's just made of, you know, vectors. Uh, it's a real, like, you can easily draw it on paper kind of thing. But the problem is that this thing that you're looking at, the display, is a discrete system. It's not continuous, if you will. It's made of pixels, right? So the goal uh, after the geometry phase is to take what you see and turn it into a grid-based system. That process is called rasterization, right? So it's going to take the continuous geometry and chop it up into tiny little pieces, and these tiny little pieces exist in three dimensions. So think of a, a giant slicer or cookie cutter uh, with many, many, many cells, and it has cells in three dimensions, and every one of those cells is called a fragment, okay? In 3D, they're not pixels, so a uh, common misnomer that you've probably heard is referring to a fragment shader as a pixel shader. Right, that's kind okay. of the crux of the question. Is I hate that, that. yes. I, I, I can't get over that. <coughs> pixel shaders don't color pixels, they color fragments. Okay, So fragment shader is the real terminology. You're basically, you're taking one of those uh, cells in 3D and determining what color it should have, if any doesn't have to have a color. Yeah. So, so one of the things I was working on, uh, I don't know, a month ago was we, in robotics you have depth cameras. Yeah. Right? So what they do is they give you a value of intensity based on how far yeah. something is. So I wanted to create a shader that would simulate that. So I went in and with the fragment, I just took the distance to the yep. camera and I just changed the intensity value. And it, yep. and it worked. And I was actually really surprised. Yep. Of course, now I, now I want to be able to add noise, graininess, dropout, that right, kind of right. thing, and I guess I have to do that. <laughs> I, I might have an example for you okay. that might help there, right? Because uh, all of the stuff that I do is, 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 it doesn't come from real information, it's all uh, simulated data, okay. right? So, yeah. uh, 
But I, I think I know what you're getting at, so I might I might have something for well, you. I kind of want to grab like I I have a I, we'll talk after, but I have a bunch of primitive blocks and stuff that I'm going to do through a depth camera. Right, sample right. that the the textures and the noise, and right. model that mathematically, and then put it back through right. a simulator. Right. I might have. Yeah. Sure. For yeah. sure. Let's talk more about that. Yeah. Definitely. But uh, any other questions about this? I didn't mention compute. The compute is basically, oh yes. So if you write a compute shader yeah. that outputs some crazy data stream, can you put that back into Yes. without leaving the video card? Yes. Or do you have to copy it out. You can, uh, you can, uh, so the, the let me uh, process the answer here. <laughs> shader, 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 All right. Uh, so a compute shader just takes, um, it really has two things that are connected to it. It has an input buffer and an output buffer. And you have to remember the motto, right? It's just data. It doesn't care what kind of buffer you're mapping to it. It can be a vertex buffer. It can be a frame buffer. It can be a texture. Okay? It can be a, just a storage buffer, right? So it really doesn't care. You're just saying here's some data in and here's some data out. Okay. Takes the data input. You define some algorithm to process it, and then copy it back to the output. So whatever the targets are, that's how you know what's being manipulated. Yeah. So, so if you're doing OpenCL or CUDA, then you're just using this compute? It's basically pure compute, yeah. Okay. That's what their right. job is, is just yeah, yeah. compute. Yeah, so deep learning and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, but that's why they were so novel Like when they first came out, yeah. is because compute shaders were not available in the modern graphics pipeline. Right. right. So here come these guys, uh, CUDA, CL, and they said, we're going to give you access to these little zones that are sitting off in the corner there that you can't really touch otherwise. And you just tell it which data yeah. is in and which data is out. And run. Right. Super fast. Yeah. Lightning fast. Because it, it, it's not part of the pipeline. It's just do your thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, you can even uh, run one compute program and then another one, okay? So kind of do the job of multi-pass uh, post-processing or something like that without even rendering a frame buffer, okay? Again, it's just data, right? <laughs> I'm gonna keep saying that, I don't care how annoying it is. <laughs> uh, so here's a few examples of uh, things you can do using the different types of shaders. I only have a few of them here. Uh, Sprite sheet animation, believe it or not, that can happen in the vertex shader. Basically, you have a U, you have a, what's called an atlas, that's what your sprite sheet is, and you have a UV, which is a sampling coordinate, per vertex, that was part of the, uh, the little box, yeah. and all you have to do is manipulate the UV, which normally for a quad is just, uh, sorry, 0 to 1, the so zero, 0 down here, 1, 1 down uh, up here, and you just manipulate the area of focus. So it kind of, you know, selects just a cell. So when you transform, like, to, when you shrink that area, the effect is that the texture appears to grow and fill that space. Okay, so that's how sprite animation works. Uh, mesh de deformation, also vertex shader. Again, you're dealing with vertices, so you unpack the position, the normal, uh, if you want skinning to happen, or just like uh, displacement mapping to make like a wavy surface or something like that, oh. all of that is modifying the position of your vertex. So if you wanted something to just go, yeah, you would do that in the shader. Yes, you would, okay. and I will show you way. that. <laughs> I will show you that. Right. Okay. So all of the mesh deformation <laughs> stuff is uh, vertex uh, particles geometry <laughs> shader. So if you have just a list of points, okay, you can skip the vertex shader entirely. You still need it in the program for some stupid reason, but you can skip over it and ignore the box and just have a different box in your geometry shader called this is my list of particles and turn those zero dimensional points into quads. Because remember that the geometry shader's job is to process every <laughs> primitive. So a point counts as a primitive, so you can say, I want to make that point into a quad. Okay? Uh, so for, for point clouds. Sorry? What do you mean for point clouds? Uh, point clouds, yeah. So you could take a point yeah, yeah. and turn it into something else. Okay. Like a little even triangle, quad, coordinate axis, 
you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, stereo 3D, VR, parallel, rendering. Hey, so this is something that uh, Unreal is like, this is, this is Unreal. Like, we're the first people. It's, it's actually really simple. Okay, so what they're doing is, uh, well, let me, a uh, quick background. Uh, they said that you no longer have to render everything twice. Okay, you're, they said that you don't have to render right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. That was the approach. Yeah. So one draw was actually two passes for stereo. Um, but they, uh, the method that uh, I believe what they're using is that they render everything one time without actually transforming uh, the vertices. They just pass everything to a vertex shader, which has the ability to also <coughs> duplicate triangles. So for every triangle that comes in, two triangles go out, and they transform one of them to the left eye, and one of them to the right eye, and then they also have what's called a split viewport. So one target over here, <coughs> one target over here, so they're actually doing simultaneous painting. So the idea is that you're rendering like the view from the, the middle eye, which yeah, doesn't get shown in the exactly. The so middle. it's like, but remember, before the uh, before the transformation actually happens, there's no such thing as a frame of reference. It's just data, right? That's the reality. It doesn't care what it is. Just how do you want to manipulate this? You know, order up, right? So you take one triangle, you split it into two, and then you send it out to the fragment shader two different places. So it actually paints two things at the same time. Okay? Uh, but you have to change the perspective slightly, so the meshes have to be rotated. Yeah, so the geometry yeah. reads in the same okay. uh, inputs that uh, the vertex shader reads. So if you pass in a transformation matrix for your left eye and a transformation for your right eye, uh, then you just apply one in one way and the other in the other, other way. Right? <clears throat> I hope I'm debunking some of the myths here. Right? It's really not all that fancy. Any and all shading, so the actual shading, fragment shader, because okay. Okay? this is all about color, right? or lack thereof. Um, Post-processing, also fragment shader. Um, normally you use that full screen quad method, so just draw a rectangle. As you draw that rectangle, fragments are generated. Every time a fragment comes into existence, uh, fragment shaders invoked. It says go, 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 right? Um, and all of the above compute. You can run a whole simulation in a compute shape. Okay, you just give it a, uh, a set of data that you want to do something with, say go, and then it'll spit back the result when it's done. And by the way, the thing about compute shaders that uh, none of the other shaders have is the ability to uh, just wait for me to finish, or don't wait for me to finish. So a compute shader, you can stop it, you can say I'm not letting you proceed until, uh, or I'm not letting anyone else do anything until the compute shader is done, or just let it go, and when it's ready, there might be a flag somewhere that just says, okay, it's done, now what, what do you want? So right? the compute shader, is that, all, is that all double precision floating point? Uh, it can be whatever precision you want. Okay. It's just you don't have to do your own multiplication <laughs> and all that. Sorry? You don't have to do your own multipliers, do you? Uh, you mean like operators? Like well, I mean, if you're doing single precision versus double precision multiplication, I mean, you oh. just want to say this times this. You don't want to go, oh, no, I have to take this uh, point, this point. Right. Again, that's where, that's where the communication with those, uh, those plugs really comes into play. Is you have to know what the data is. Yeah. So uh, GLSL, for example, has different data types for double and single. Okay. Right? So if you declare, for example, a matrix, if you say MAT4, MAT4, that's float. You have 16 floats in a matrix. Okay. If you write DMAT4, so DMAT4, that is 16 doubles in a matrix. Okay? So you just have to know for sure that the data you stored in the buffer was either floats or doubles. Okay. okay? Yes. So I'm, I'm 
made good headway on understanding the fragment thing, but I have another question. So sure. when you get done with the vertex of geometry step, you yeah. basically end up with a, a viewport that hasn't been drawn yet. Correct. Okay, correct. Yeah. So what is a fragment, like a fragment, is that in viewport space? Like, is it a proportion of the viewport? Like, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm imagining that the fragment represents some little massively parallel thing on the GPU that can get stuffed into a spot and yes, worked on. Yes. But what is the, like, how do you describe a fragment? Like, because I'm, I'm undoing my thought of it being a pixel shader. Okay, and I'm yeah. throwing that out. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. What, what the heck is a fragment's data? <laughs> like? It's, it's uh, a fragment's data. It's like, I keep doing this. Yeah, it's yeah. a fragment in my mind. Again, right? think, of it, think of it as in the viewport, yeah. right, which is aligned to the raster. Right? So mm -hmm. the raster is that giant slicer that literally just comes through and says, chop. Hey, everything is now tiny. You're you got fragments here. Hey, the data of a fragment is color, right? So it's like think of each cube, each tiny little uh -huh. cube, each cell as just like a little, you know, a cup. That is it typically one pixel, but awesome? just many pixels deep, or is it multiple pixels? It's deep? like it's. Okay, I see what you're getting at. You know what I'm at. saying? Like, what's the yeah. slice? Is it, is I see it, what you're getting at. So, you, yeah. I can go into more detail if everyone is yeah. okay with that. I, I don't mean to derail it. No, I'm, that's I, cool. I'll ask the same question. Like, yeah. is it this a is voxel the discussion that, I wanted you, to have. Is the color yeah. for a voxel within your... And then, um, then you're projecting all that onto the rendering? It's basically, yeah. It's like you're filling a voxel with color. Okay. Uh, what happens then, okay, so here's what happens, is you're, <laughs> that little 3D box, you're painting it, you're filling it with paint, um, and then after the fragment shader, okay, so it's like when the fragment shader is finished execution, uh, it goes through testing. Okay, so there's the depth test, uh, uh, the stencil test, which actually happens before. Okay, so uh, stenciling, think of it like, you know, a stencil where something doesn't fit, it gets thrown out. Um, mm -hmm. But after the fragment shader, it goes through what's called depth uh, depth testing. So basically it's going to compare the uh, that cell's depth, right? So yep. the cell's Z value that you just produced, it's going to compare that one value with whatever value is already stored in the depth buffer. So think of that as a, uh, a flat image. That's what the depth buffer is, is because ultimately we're dealing with the 2D image. You yep. have a separate texture sure, to sure. store that one-dimensional value. So it compares with that. Uh -huh. If it passes the test, then the new color that you just created will go into the color buffer. This is the, this is the, I can end the, the line of inquiry right here. Is it just one color that comes out? Ultimately? One color of, that comes out of a fragment shader? Yeah. Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, is it, is bad. it, are we trying to figure out one pixel from a it bunch is, of data, or is it, is, is it a grid of pixels that is okay. arbitrarily sized? <laughs> I, need to, I need to think of a new way to explain okay, this better. You, That's can, a you great should keep question. going, and I'll... That's a great I'll, question. No, I love that question, trust me, because you're going to see this. So I want to okay, make okay. sure we're familiar, right? right? So there's another mode that you can only do with off-screen rendering, so that invisible uh, target off to the side, called uh, multiple render targets. And that basically says you have this uh, depth image, which stores just the Z location of a fragment. Mm -hmm. And then you have a whole bunch of other layers in front of that. All of those layers store color. So that little cell, okay, you can actually fill that with multiple colors and say, I want this color to be assigned to that target over there, so this layer right here, uh -huh. and I want the second color to go to this one, and I want the third one to go to this one, right? It's just that, what that means is, if the fragment passes the test, then those respective outputs will be placed in, in, in their respective image. Okay. Okay, and the depth, buff, the depth value, excuse me, will also be stored in the Z texture, yes. But uh, conventionally with a fragment shader, are you are you basically writing like a color and a depth value? Is that kind of conventionally? Yes, it's okay. color. Of what, what about transparency though? Like one location, one lo one cell. 
In the saying rationing. pixel's not cool? Sorry? Is saying pixel not correct? You're saying... Well, you're I, I want to break that. You know, okay. I want this culture shift. Of stuff no, I'm, I'm on board. I'll go wherever, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, wherever you're... It's at that, at that one fragment, yeah. that one location in the raster, you can have up to the number of outputs supported by your graphics card. You don't have to write depth. You don't have to write color. You right. can write up to one depth and as many colors as is, is supported by your, uh, your graphics card. And typically eight is a normal number. If you're running on a Titan or something, you probably have like 16. Mm -hmm. okay, so that means 16 layers can possibly be colored if the test is passed, yes. I'm just, I'm just curious, about, curious about what the, what is the application for, you know, what is the application for doing this multiple color? I can show you. Great. I have an Great. example Perfect. for that. See, I, I guess I prepared better than I did, right? I hope I'm not talking too much. No, no, no. I, I really wanted to show you some uh, things, but uh, I'll tell you, let's, let's move on and then we'll... Uh, we'll so I have one quick question. Yeah, sure. You're replacing the, the color based on Z value. With, with, if there's transparency, are you mixing the colors? <laughs> That's or? a separate test. Okay. So you can actually, uh, typically what people do for alpha yeah. is draw uh, transparent objects separately. Okay. And then composite them back into the scene. So you have like two off-screen targets, one for opaque objects okay. and one for transparent objects. Yeah. And then you do a, a post-processing pass to put them together. And you have the depth buffer of each of them, so you can do a little comparison, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how you know if an object is occluded or not. Is okay. you, do, you, do the, you do what's called the manual depth test, right? Okay. It's like if the depth is greater, then it's behind. If the depth test is, or if the depth value is less, then it's in front, so I would put it there. Or blend it with the existing value. The automatic uh, uh, blending test, uh, you can turn that on and OpenGL will do it for you. Okay. So if you have an object with uh, alpha, uh, it'll do the mixing for you. So it won't replace the value in the color buffer, it'll mix it. Okay. You have like source, destination, source is uh, the new thing, and destination is what was previously there. There's some formula that defines how they get mixed together. Cool? Yeah. <laughs> so while we were talking about compute, uh, a friend of mine just sent me an example. I can, again, I can post these uh, slides. Uh, that's the whole setup and compute shader. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's the C, uh, C++ side. He's uh, setting up what's called a shader storage buffer, which is that general purpose, it's just data store. Okay. Uh, he's saying uh, pass in the image width and height, so he wants to do something uh, that's based on the image dimension. So uh, I guess replacing the full screen quad is probably what he's doing. Uh, and then here he just says uh, dispatch compute. So there's your go button. And a memory barrier just basically says wait until it's done so you don't overwrite anything else. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I thought that would just be cool to share. Literally, two general purpose buffers uh, connected to the shader. Okay, so they're just bound, plugged in, and hit the go button, do stuff. Okay. What it looks like is. It says copy. That is the operation that he is doing. He is copying from one buffer to the other. Very fast. Okay, very, very, very quickly, yeah. Yeah, but he has to move the data into the GPU and back up. Right, it's right. Slow. So, again, because a compute shader can link to whatever type of buffer you want it to, like, there could be uh, data already there, right? So, instead of just copying the data, he's doing, like, a little custom copy, right? So, I, I looked at that for a second, I'm like, let's see what... Yeah, you're just copying the data, right? <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much uh, that, okay? Uh, so who cares about shaders? Uh, basically, uh, programmers, of course, build the engine, right? You know, test some shaders, make sure everything's wired up correctly, uh, feed the data, feed me, nom nom nom, right? Uh, artists manipulate the data, make pretty things. Uh, designers, it is high level. Okay? Shaders are actually pretty high level compared to uh, C. 
you know. Um, so designers can code too. Uh, producer, think about it. Graphics, everyone loves graphics. Happy player, dollar bills, okay. Uh, and other simulation film stage audio. So just a fun story quickly is uh, I was doing a production, like a stage production here in Vermont, uh, and uh, I was talking to the lighting guy, and like never met this dude before, and he just starts talking about GLSL. I'm like, what do you do with GLSL? And he's like, you know those light shows that like you see at like some, you know, bars and like a band is playing and stuff, and like he's in the booth. He's just fucking projecting GLSL. Excuse my French, but I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> right? So he's not using any fancy software. He's just like on this online tool to just code GLSL, and he's up there in the booth programming shaders in real time <laughs> and sending them out. It's <laughs> live coding. Yeah. Just, oh but like people know, but like people can't see the code. It's yeah, just yeah. he's like, you know, this is like the the uh, the render window is being projected onto the stage while these people are, you know, rocking. And then, and he's just sitting there writing GLSL. I'm like, that is amazing. Have you ever heard of that? Laser like, sorry? Or, you mean like the little laser points or the projected images on? Just like a projector, like, uh, we don't have one in here, right? You know, one like shader right? toy or something? Or? Yeah, like on one of those. I can't, it wasn't shader toy, I can't remember which one he was on. But it was one of those online <laughs> prototyping things. And it like transitioned smoothly. And, I was like, holy crap, you know? <laughs> anyway, so like anyone can use shaders, you know? And uh, yeah. Uh, Unreal, Unity, Maya, the trick is that they just write the shaders for you. So when you use the material editor that's writing a shader so that you don't have to, it figures it out for you. Um, you just define materials, okay? So here's the part where I wanted to say, uh, why, show, why tell you when I can show you, right? Uh, so I'm going to do the risky thing here and, and uh, do some live shader. Live code. Okay? Oh, nice. So what, what were those examples that you wanted to see? Remind me. Let me, uh, let me actually write them down. So you wanted uh, multiple targets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what else? I think Jeff wanted to Ten see like a little... Like, oh, the, oh, yeah, there was the expanding, contracting... So mesh. Oh, like the mesh? The bringing yeah. the mesh, yeah. Uh, we talk, talk about transparency, um, the depth, um, uh, depth camera. Uh, depth, yeah. I'd be curious, and, and this would kind of answer my question with the fragment shader. Like mm -hmm. my, I guess where I landed on what you're talking about is that it does represent like one location on the screen, but yeah. at various steps. Yeah. Like how do you do something like a blur? Where you're talking to neighbors, like yep. that. That I think Ooh. would kind of give oh, me the. the Gaussian blur. Yeah. Anything crystallize else? some stuff. That's um, actually, that's I've done an outline easy. shader. Before. Outline? Yeah, I've gone work through the examples, but that, that's okay. a pretty common one, I think. That kind of that's actually kind of on the same lines as blur. So that's okay. called. Uh, it, I can show you both, and we can do that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's a pretty good handful. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'll Shaker, combine Shaker my uh, show and tell time into this. Okay, so. <clears throat> I have uh, what's called uh, Animal 3D, which is a uh, just a uh, obvious framework that I've been building. I use it for teaching as well. Uh, I'm going to put up the multiple render targets one first. Okay. Please work. There you go. Okay. So first things first, I'll show you what I meant by the uh, double buffer flickering. Um, because uh, this computer, uh, if you don't explicitly write a render target, it'll assume, okay? Mm. And the background is not getting written to. So when you move the camera even a little bit, I can find my cursor. Is it over there? Mm -hmm. You can't see it, anyway. Oh wow, it worked, I must have fixed it. <laughs> oh, there you go. So you end up with that uh, leftover uh -huh. artifacty kind of thing. Um, it's not flickering, it's just kind of painting over, so you mm -hmm. get a whole bunch of garbage. 
Okay, yes. Now, is that a bunch of different objects still stuck in the render buffer? Yeah, because I haven't cleared it. So I haven't said erase everything. I just kind of assume that the skybox would be drawn over it. It's called a skybox clear. Okay, it just doesn't bother to erase anything. It just <laughs> says you're going to be drawing the skybox anyway, so that'll just go right in front of everything. Uh, so I'm actually going to uh, reload this one so that we don't have that, okay? And uh, the MRT shader, so the multiple render targets, let me find my cursor again. It looks like uh, this. <clears throat> so I'll actually I'll make that a bit bigger. Okay, so normally a single output would just have like outvec for frag color. Okay, but what you can actually do is specify uh, which layer an output will be drawn onto. Okay, so here I have eight layers, and at the end of the shader you'll see that, or rather the whole shader, uh, all it does is grab the data that came to it from the vertex shader and just output it. Okay, there is some slight transformation going on just because of the mismatch, versus, uh, the mismatch between XYZ and RGB. Uh, XYZ can be between, well, you know, negative... Uh, lowest float and highest float, right? Uh, for normals, they're normalized, so the values can be between minus one and positive one, uh, but color has to be constrained uh, between zero and one. So uh, this little map, all that does is take that value and compress it into the visible spectrum range, okay? Negatives, you can't see those. They just appear to be chopped up, okay? So that's an MRT shader, so uh, the framework allows you to edit in real time. Uh, so right now we're on target zero, that's one, and some of them don't show up because they don't have data. Okay, so if I want to take uh, this one. What are you changing? Sorry. I just have like a mode, it just says oh, okay. which. Which layer do you want to present? It just does that, okay? Uh, so I'm going to change uh, target number. Uh, damn it, I can't read because it's accumulating. Uh, I'll just change all of them. How about that? Hopefully one of them will work. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. This is always the risky part because you never know what's going to happen, and I forgot that it's going to accumulate like that. So I will edit the first one. I actually don't know where my cursor is. You so can't duplicate to your laptop? Sorry? Can you duplicate the screen to your laptop? So you uh, oh yeah, I mean I could do that. Yeah. I guess I'm basically done with the... Uh... We can sit you down the corner and get you to. Yeah. <clears throat> That's... Sorry for the delay. My head is not on today. <laughs> I hope you're not bored. No, <laughs> no this is cool. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that on one side and that on the other side. Okay, so I'm going to move over here. There we go. Get rid of some of those notes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have position on the screen. So that's this one. So I'm going to say, instead of that, I'll just say, uh, maybe the color red. You have to remember RGBA. So if I reload it, the color red will show up everywhere. Okay, so any, it basically says, any time a fragment passes the test, uh, slot zero will contain the color red. Okay. Uh, what it said before was, any time a fragment passes the test, uh, slot zero will contain uh, whatever the position 
vector was. Okay. Yeah, you take the position, convert it to an RGB value. Yeah, right. that's all I was doing there. Right. Uh, I was normalizing it so it was actually like the direction from the center of the object as RGB. Oh, okay. Uh, now I'll show you something else because you were curious about uh, alpha and stuff like that. So if I change the alpha value to let's say half, okay. So remember, it's just drawing on top of whatever was there before. So it's going to actually give you like a accumulation. Uh, it might not actually be doing it because it is overwritten with the uh, skybox. Uh, but if I move around, you kind of see like a motion blur <laughs> kind of effect. You see that? Mm -hmm. So it can be more prominent if you uh, turn this up a little bit. Or down. That's really what's fun about them is just like changing values and seeing what happens. It's very faint, but it is there. How would you fix that if you wanted both the skybox to right over the back, or like when you rotate the camera to have the skybox keep being there, but also have the objects accumulate like that? Uh, I could do that. <laughs> um, yeah, again, the problem is that, excuse me, the skybox just kind of overtakes everything that was previously there, so, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, that's a really simple example of multiple render targets. Okay, so one fragment has eight outputs in this case. And I can also uh, mess with the depth as well. Uh, so there's this one value called uh, GL frag depth, you basically set that to whatever you want. Uh, okay, so that, that kind of, uh, let me turn that off, sorry. Okay, so the bottom of the uh, teapot is actually being rendered on the top, and also the, uh, the spout and the handle, and the cylinder is rendering in front of the uh, uh, sphere, so right? So basically, uh, everything is flattened out. The only depth possible is 0 0.5. So whatever gets drawn first is so going to stay. Yeah. Okay, so you do fun things like that. Uh, I'll do another one. Uh, let's see, what else was on the list there? We got uh, mesh manipulation, so making things uh, you know, bigger, smaller. Okay, so up, actually. Uh, I'll do this in the uh, skinning demo. Okay, so the whole point of skinning is uh, mesh manipulation. So I have this uh, animated uh, character. Uh, sorry for the lack of textures, I just didn't finish this uh, program. Um, so the shader that goes with that, again, this is all uh, vertex work. Okay, so a skinning shader. Okay, so there's your uh, skinning algorithm right there. Okay, so basically just some vector uh, with a set of influence weights and in indices. So which influence uh, from the list you want, how much strength should that influence have. Uh, basically, uh, select the influence and transform the vector by that influence. Okay? Add the result and mix them together. But that's not really what you're interested in. So after that, okay, so you can see that uh, the position tangent by tangent normal have been skinned. I'm actually going to take the uh, position before outputting it. So this is the final output. And I'm going to add a little bit of the normal to it. Okay, so the normal is a vector that points away from the surface. So if I take the position and just add a little bit of that vector, then it'll actually kind of make your character uh, not do anything. Sorry, <laughs> can I save it? That might be the wrong 
that. I wonder if I'm using the right value. We have a GL position there below. Yeah, I mean that's the final output, so we want it to be the. Uh, so if you if you create like a syntax error here, will it just not render anything or? Just Sorry. If you, you try to break garbage it. in to create a syntax error. Yeah, I could do that. Does it? When you save it, does it just stop? Nope. So I'm actually. It, it appears I'm using the wrong okay. uh, oh. uh, shader for this particular uh, demo. So let me go and find the right one. Really, it looked like the error was the. Yeah, you had Sorry, an error. you had yeah, an error with the. It actually, it shouldn't be drawing anything. So, um, it's alive. <laughs> maybe it's this one. So that one definitely has an error, but since it didn't do anything, I'm gonna guess that I'm in the wrong file. Sorry about that. Let's try this one. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Face plant. Face plant, indeed. Yeah. Okay, so, I'm going to, the normal isn't currently being read, so I'm going to read it. This is an example of where the surgery happens, because if you get one of those numbers wrong, you're actually reading from a different portion of the buffer. Okay. I'll give you an example. Okay, so while we're here, I'll just show you, like, I can see that the number corresponding to text chord is 8. So what if I did 8 for position instead? <laughs> okay. So I'm basically saying that that is, a, uh, that is the position. And that's actually directly reading from the uh, texture coordinate and using it as a position. Okay. Remember, what's the motto? It's it's data. Data. It doesn't care about anything, right? <laughs> so uh, you can do that for anything you want. Okay, number two is normal. Kind of cool, not what we want. Okay, so let's uh, let's stick with this uh, correct thing, and I'll make the character a little bit fatter. So I'll just uh, do the same thing for normal. And I'll do that, I'll do what I would suggest we do before, which is uh, if we just add a little bit of the normal. Okay, so it actually kind of destroyed him a little bit. Uh, so what you have to do is convert this. Okay, this is uh, just me going really fast. So it doesn't have a, a W component, and that should do it. So we need a bit more. Okay, so it's kind of getting a little uh, chubby. Okay, and uh, we want to make them uh, skinnier here, so we can just actually subtract a little bit and see what happens. I think I've seen fur done in this kind of way. Sorry? I think oh, I've shells. seen like, fur done in this kind of yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you expand. expand. So exactly, you can, right? So you can run like a, like, um, like, how would you time a loop within this? Like, I need this on one second frequency. Right. So uh, that's what uh, these little things called uh, uniforms are for. It's basically uh, any value coming from the API. So okay. you want a, a float called time, yeah. and you would pass a float in, and just every frame, just send in the current time, and you can have a function. Oh, okay. So right? you can update your shader on the fly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's what uniforms are for. Just yeah. like, uniform means uniform for the whole object. So, okay. whereas the vertex shader okay. operates on a per vertex basis, a uniform is for the whole permanent. So it doesn't okay. change for every vertex, or fragment, or triangle. It's uh, the same for the whole program. So, so one of the things I've been doing with outline shaders is that I, I would, when you click on an object, I change it to the material with the outline shader, and you click yeah. off, then it goes back to whatever its material was before, but you're just saying you would just 
change with yeah. the uniform, turn on the outline, turn it off. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much, okay. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so what t people might do for outline is uh, invert. So render the o render the object a second time with yeah. the faces inverted, uh, so that it only renders the back face. Yeah. And then do this process. What I just did to make the object a bit fatter. You did make it, yeah. Make yeah. It and then you, you get see, weird corners, though. Yeah, you get really weird. That's the problem with that. So yeah. the method that uh, Ben suggested, uh, that kind of falls in the same category as blurring, is post-process L1. Okay, yeah. So, okay. Are we satisfied with this? Yeah. One? yeah. Okay. So just for laughs. <laughs> <laughs> Super job. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, next on the list we have. Now you have to do your colliders too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, collision. Uh, the depth reconstruction. So uh, I think I know what you mean by that. Yeah. So I'm going to open a uh, deferred uh, rendering demo here. Okay. Uh, just kind of shameless plug to myself because uh, I was. Uh, interested in doing this. Um, uh, the maximum number of lights is 4,096. Okay, and it still runs at 30 frames per second. Not as good as my desktop, which runs at 60, but 30 FPS on a crap top, pretty good. 4,000 lights. Okay. But that's not really why we're here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to step back. Uh, so those are all the lights. Okay. Uh, so the shader that is used uh, to do that is a fragment shader. Okay. <clears throat> So the way this process actually works is, skippy, skip, skip, okay. I'll do this with uh, one light just to show you what that looks like. Okay. I, actually, I, I set it so that it increments by 32 every time. So we'll do 32 different lights. Okay. Uh, the way that it works is uh, it actually draws a single sphere uh, for every light that is rendered. Okay. So. Uh, what we can do, what I, the way that I teach uh, shaders is I actually say, uh, you know, they don't have the complete shader. Step by step, every time we change something, we actually visualize what the data looks like. Okay, so uh, there's this thing here called screen position, which would, as a matter of fact, be the object being rendered in screen space. Okay, so basically uh, the raw fragments in space, position. Okay, so I can return there and say, uh, I'm just going to use uh, target number two, say light color equals screen pause. Okay, so you kind of see little bubbles uh, and they're being accumulated. Okay, so they're additive, that's like, like adds, right? So it just keeps adding. Um, but that's basically what your light looks like in the scene. Okay. Okay, so it's a little bubble. Uh, the goal of uh, deferred rendering is because we don't know what position uh, is in the scene at that particular location. We actually have to reconstruct uh, the scene uh, in 3D. So this is kind of going along your, your depth camera thing. Yeah. And so all we have is uh, the depth buffer, right? And we know where we are in the screen. Okay? Screen space is this value. So we can actually do what's called the uh, reverse perspective uh, projection or re reverse perspective divide, uh, which takes us back to camera space. Okay. So I'll just remove the uh, return statement here, and I'll put it there. It 
it's going to throw away a bunch of stuff and they're not being used. Okay. So the color that you're looking at here is actually the 3D coordinate in iSpace. Basically says, where are you relative to the camera? Okay. Right? So I, th I, don't, I think that was on, on the lines of what you were going with the, the depth. Yeah, the, the, the way mine ended up looking like if you took a sphere, okay, mm -hmm. the point closest to you on the sphere was the lightest color and everything else was getting darker as you went right. away from the sphere. We had a sphere further away, same thing, but not as light at the point right, closest right. to you. So it's going, I just did in grayscale, darker toward the background, right, lighter right. towards you, and as you move the camera, of course, everything right. is being reshaded. Right, so you, you end up with something uh, kind of like, uh, if I don't know with that. I think I did it with... Fragment, changing the fragment. Sorry, I think I did changing the color out of the fragment based on its yeah, yeah, of course. position, distance from the camera, because I passed in the camera coordinate. At the end of the day, I mean, the <laughs> same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll show you an example. So we have depth, 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 one. Okay. Okay. So this is actually the sample from the depth buffer. Oh yeah, but you're accumulating right light, so it's yeah, kind of yeah, flat. Yeah, so you okay. can't really see. Yeah. Uh, but you sort of see the teapot <laughs> yeah. in the scene there. Okay. Uh, the problem with this method again is that uh, because it's meant to be optimized, fragments are only generated where there is light. So yeah. if there's going to be no light, you just kind of get cut off. Uh, so that's why you only see part of the teapot. Yeah, yeah. So you let's see the depth reverse from. Sorry. If you want it wider. Closer in towards the camera, but uh, so the depth buffer is actually stored where zero is in your face and one is infinitely far away. Mm -hmm. Or so you at the far flip point. it here, right? So that uh, white closer. You could, yeah. I mean, you could do that, right? So if I said uh, one you know, minus depth or whatever. One minus depth. Right. So just invert the color there. Yeah. Then everything else becomes uh, black if it's not, you know, so it's the same issue, but you still get, you know, a bit of the teapot. Yeah, that's it. That's basically it. Cool. Uh, other examples. Quick time. Blur and outlines. I can kind of combine those into one. Uh, so one of my favorite examples is the Bloom demo. So I'm sure we've all heard of Bloom before, right? Uh, Depends how much you want. Okay, so let's go right to the end there. We have <laughs> enough bloom uh, for a lifetime. Okay, um, but the way this actually works is over here. So we have a blur uh, uh, function. Okay, so this is actually a uh, full screen effect. I call Gaussian blur. Because you asked about neighbors, right? So how would you go about... Is that, yeah. is that done on a 2D buffer at the end as a post-process? Yeah, so this is all post-processing. Okay. Yeah. So basically we have the image of the scene. Yeah. We're just going to draw it to that quad. It's kind of like just texture a quad. Yeah. And then as we do that, we know where we're standing on that image because every fragment has a screen space coordinate associated with it. Okay. It's like it matches the viewport, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we know where we're standing. So we can use that location to sample from the texture there, and if we know how big one pixel is, right, the width of a pixel and the height of a pixel, then we can actually just offset that center value by that vector, because okay, that's a that that kind of neighbor is is actually a vector. It's like we know the size, uh, so like one pixel to the left would be plus uh, or minus width. So like step over there, and if you want to sample up, then you just add a little pixel height. Okay. Did I just do like convolution with a kernel across the. Team? It's a kernel. Okay. Yeah. So okay. so are you basic? Is it basically that you, oh, you do the yeah you do the full render first for each pixel, mm -hmm. and then once you have that yes yes then you can do things. That's all post processing. Splat it, it yeah, to where that's it. it. Okay. You have the image. You've got the source data. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you go for edges. So Sorry? What if you 
Yeah, so you want edge detection. Yeah. Yeah. So we do that instead. It's the same process. So I can actually uh, I'll write this one from. It's not part of this uh, thing. Basically, uh, Pascal's triangle is great for blurring. And every number, every row adds up to a power of two, which is extremely convenient. Um, and then you just uh, know the weight. It's a normal distribution, math stuff. Hooray, math. Um, so if you want, uh, if you want a, uh, a lot of garbage in this one, where's the final output? <laughs> oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to not do that. So using the uh, debugging process that uh, my students would use, I just have the image sample here, so I'm going to output it. Okay. Actually, sorry. Um, I can never make up my mind with like how I want to do things. I'm just going to make sure it works by uh, inverting it. And I killed it. That's a different thing. Oh, that's what we wanted. Right, right. So it's multi stage, so it's actually blur and then blur again. So invert and then invert again would uh, uh, not do anything. Okay, so we have an image. So not inverting it should give us the original scene. Uh, color corrected. Okay, uh, it is downsized, which is why it looks kind of boxy. But let's uh, ignore that for now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to reach over to neighboring pixels and I'll perform what's called a uh, Sobel filter, which is basically just an edge detection algorithm that says what's the delta uh, from the left to the right and from the bottom to the top. Uh, and the result will be an outline. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, vec4 uh, center left equals uh, texture image. That's our position in the raster. Uh, subtract uh, vec2 because I want to only go to the left, so uh, pixel size x, 0, whoops, okay, so nothing will happen there, but I can actually check if it worked, okay, so you see that, you see the image just shift a little bit, okay, yeah. I'll do it again, Okay. Is pixel size coming from the API? Uh, that's a uniform, so one of those global variables. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I sent that in from my C program and said use that all the time. Okay. okay. Which makes sense because the pixel size is the same for every pixel in this image, right? Um, so we have a shift. It actually moved to the right. Uh, it appears to move to the right because we were sampling to the left. Okay, so it's basically say at this position color as if we're standing here. Okay, yeah. so the result is a shift in the right direction, yes. So what about if they're at the farthest point and like how do you deal with uh, already out of bounds when looking for the next one? Ah, uh, so that, that's where you gotta be careful, right? So if I show you an example of uh, moving too far to the right, you get your edge. Okay, that might actually be far too much. Let me uh, say uh, 0 0.5. Turned out great, I think. Yeah, <laughs> love it. So, so, okay, so you actually kind of get an edge uh, a little bit. Nope. Where is it? Uh, it's actually, oh yeah, 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 so I should specify that I'm actually cheating a little bit. Uh, part of the, 
with that exact issue, you end up uh, sampling from either the border or if you're doing a looping texture, then you end up sampling from the other side, yeah. uh, which looks really weird when you actually composite it. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually rendering uh, my quad is actually this big yeah. compared to the window. So it's doing extra work to, on the side and all those fragments are just thrown away after. Okay, so it's hard to show because they're all offset, but you get what I mean. Uh, so that is uh, the left. Okay, I'll do one uh, to the right. Is there any quick way of like fixing that without having to like check to make sure that you're not yeah. seeing the range? Or... Um, you just shrink the. You can just. Uh, Transform the texture coordinate to like be smaller, and then it'll just be like you'll just see the edges. I can show you that too if you want. <laughs> so, um, say, uh, times half uh, plus point two five. Nope. Uh, CR. Okay, so that made it bigger. So if I want to make it uh, smaller, uh, we go the other way, which is uh, times one and a half minus a quarter. Okay, so you can kind of see the edges oh, yeah. along the side. So that's an opportunity for like vignette and cool like border effects. Okay, so actually I'll leave it like that. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, but uh, actually no, I won't because I want to. <laughs> I think this will be the last example for me. Okay, so that's uh, CR. Uh, the difference, I'll just do a very simple uh, gradient. Okay, so what you normally look for in a, uh, an edge detection is the difference between these two. Okay. And what you end up with is kind of a very bright uh, outline wherever the, the, the two pixel samples are radically different and very dark where it is not. Okay, so the result, instead of uh, hard coding the alpha, we can just invert it. Okay. So now you have your black outlines uh, on the edges. And so it's so to make like a, a drawn kind of look. You can, yeah. You, you can take this and then overlay it back on. Exactly. So if you have this on, for example, uh, I'll just show you tune shading. Right, so if you have that on uh, cell shading, for example, it looks very cartoony. You have the outline post-process, okay. Um, but that's pretty much the live uh, part of it. So uh, I did have a couple more messages for you. <laughs> uh, let's see back here, whoops. I apologize for this. Here we are. Recap. <laughs> okay, so uh, what does our future hold because of uh, shaders and wanting to learn? Uh, personally, I haven't had much time to ju uh, jump into uh, uh, Vulcan, so I really want to do that. Um, but overall, better graphics means uh, better game. You can really understand, right, get over that that intimidation factor of like what you can actually do with these things. Uh, then you can do fun things like that and just like make your game uh, look better, okay? Uh, if you want to play around with stuff, here's some cool things to check out. Okay, so Kick.js has a vertex shader and fragment shader that you can play with. Uh, shader toy, only fragment shader, so if you just want to be like post-processing stuff. Uh, and some other things, people have done really cool things, like playing a whole Pac-Man and Doom game uh, within a fragment shader. 
Okay, so they program the whole damn game in one file and <laughs> go. Okay. Uh, and that basically, because it's per fragment, it says simulate the game at every point uh, relative <laughs> to the screen, you know? Uh, so it's kind of crazy. Uh, if you haven't already, learn some math, read a book, <laughs> just do it. Okay, li literally, that's all I did when I was interested in this stuff, just jump right in. Okay, the math helps. Okay, quaternions, shameless plug there. Okay, <laughs> matrices, uh, especially matrices and vectors. Uh, there's a ton of books out there, so the books uh, that I'm using are uh, the Blue Book, it's called, OpenGL Super Bible. It has like a whole bunch of stuff, including just raw OpenGL and GLSL. And, uh, uh... How old is that book? Sorry? Is it... Is it is it up to date? It's, uh, yeah, the, the, the current edition is 7 or 8. Okay. It came out when uh, 4 or 5, or 4, four okay. or 5 came out. So oh, the like, GL Super Bible. Yeah. It yeah. covers all the shaders and then... It covers all, it covers the architecture and gives you a few cool examples like tune shading, like like some of the stuff that I have here yeah. as well. Yeah. And like the stereo trick, for example, like yeah. that's why it's in like Unreal. It's not that groundbreaking, like it's in the blue book, right? So it's yeah. like they tell you how to actually do it, like using a geometry sheet. Huh. Okay, so stuff like that. Uh, and remember, it's just data, and communication is key, and there's a lot to do, so get busy. Thank you very much. All right. I don't want to up too much of your time here, so if you want to talk, uh, you can talk after, but I want to do your uh, show and tell. But I want to see what you're working on, right? So. Oh, do that, sir. We're doing show and tell. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's eight now. I went way over. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I, this is great. This is great. So, um, do we, let's uh, first. Any questions? Oh yeah, if you have any more questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, I I am curious. I did look around for outline shaders, and I mm -hmm. tried some of the stuff online, and I got yeah. a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. um, but then I looked at what. At least what they do in Blender. I mean, I didn't look at their shader, but I look at when you click on different parts, how well they outline those, and it, it looked quite a bit different than anything I'd seen. So maybe I'll, I'll send you like a yeah, sure, yeah, snapshot, sure. and you can look at it. And go, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very smooth on the round, and, and and then the corners were good too. Usually when you get a cube, you get this. Yeah, yeah. Weirdness. So I imagine that it's still kernel based. Yeah. Uh, generally, kernels are square and major, um, but you can do like a a weighting. It kind of is like a circle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you just have like zeros on the corners, that means those pixels relative to you in the center will just not have any influence. Yeah. All right. Okay. I just wondered maybe they, I wonder if they even do it with a shader. Maybe they use yeah. something else. For sure. You do anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> the possibilities are endless. Oh, I had another question. I, I, um, sorry. I, I saw under Unity somebody had something they called a uh, low poly shader. So this was the idea that they were doing vertex or fragment shading uh, or vertex only shading? Low poly shader. Like so apparently it was like much faster than using like a typical yeah, d the default shaders in Unity. Level of like what level of detail related? Or no, no. It was just that you like there's a low poly art style. Mm -hmm. Right where you're just everything is oh very, yeah yeah very very low I don't know all the honest. I don't know if that would be a shader it sounds to me like they just they might just use a low poly uh, model as the asset no the idea is that you, when you have low poly assets mm -hmm. you use this shader so much faster oh on mobile oh, devices I guess it. so it's like whatever they're doing in the shader will be good for yeah. low poly model yeah I guess. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, play. definitely share. Like, honestly, yeah, share stuff, and uh, I'm curious as well. Could be fake news. We <laughs> <laughs> see a lot of stuff on the asset. Was it asset that doesn't news? Add up. Yeah. Well, a lot of times, <laughs> low poly models, um, they just color each face, right, mm -hmm. as a single color. So that might be. Yeah. Maybe the shader does that. That's yeah. that's what it is. There's no variation. Yeah, rather well, than well, I guess texture. Well, you just do vertex hmm. printing, typically. Yeah, right. Yeah, what does it say? Maybe that's why I'm finally here. It is. Anything else in the meantime? Or? Yeah. Great talk. Yeah, that's great. great. Yeah, that was awesome. yeah, thank so you. <laughs> I get it now.
Uh, there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll continue this discussion. Yeah. Alright, so uh, this uh, was a, a little uh, shader that I uh, put together. Um, just using very simple uh, you know, shapes you can do some, uh, some fun stuff with. Uh, it's basically a way for you to you know, parameterize a bunch of eyes. So you can you know, set the colors, set the shapes, set the, you know, does it have like a third eye? Does it have, you know, um, where is it? So here you can see the, you know, I'm editing the material here. And so you can generate all these kind of like cool little eyes, but just like very kind of basic math and shapes. Um, and, you know, so it's, uh, it's up there, it's on the, uh, the asset store. Um, this was the first time I actually felt like I was able to wrap my hands around a shader and actually kind of understand, you know, all of it instead of just being like, yeah, I'm tweak that. Well, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, I break it but, away. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, so that's uh, that's a little. So ultimately, are you generating a um, a two D texture? That needs to be UV mapped onto a thing, or so it does. Uh, so uh, like, or, or in a second here. So, so basically, it it basically is yes. It's so it's a fragment shader, just to basically mapping to you uh -huh. know a zero to one UV, okay. right? And okay. that's uh, that's all that's going on. So you know, anything that works with that. Oh, you're like dynamically dynamically drawing, you're drawing circles image. with math and stuff. That's yep. cool. Yep, that's cool. Yep. All right. I like it. Oh. Did you end up you know, keeping my uh, model in there? Yeah, I, I think I did. I, I, I did. There was like little. I had to do like little tweaks. So, so I'm so bad at Blender. I, uh, I went on to the Slack and I'm like, uh, I need like a half dome. <laughs> uh, take a sphere, just cut off half of it, and give it to me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and Curse like, there you go. And, uh, <laughs> Um, so I'm that bad at Blender, um, and uh, it, uh, it it was uh, it was great. It helped me get over the hump and, and do what I needed to do. I did have to like go into Blender though, and like you know I just had little things that I wanted to like reorient it, um, you know, so that it was like facing up and the center of it was like right, as, you know, without just parenting it to something, which is what I would normally do. But since, you know, since it was an asset, I was like, oh, I'll try to do it the right way. Um, but uh, but yeah. It's uh, it's in there. It's uncredited. Uh, oh, you know. oh, oh man. Uh, no royalties. Sue me. You made a lot of money on that. No, show. nothing. <laughs> uh, I mean, a few bucks here and there, like pizza money. Uh, yep. All right. Nice. Anybody else have anything they want to show uh, with a web browser? I yeah. can. Uh, I can very quickly talk about what I've been doing. Yeah, please. Um, uh, so yeah, I I, sh I finished Headmaster um, last uh, when the PlayStation VR came out, and then last summer got it onto Oculus and Steam. Thank you. And uh, and last GBC, I was talking to a friend of mine named Chris Pruitt, who's one of the developer relations people at Oculus and he and his team built a game called Dead Secret for um, the Gear VR um, when it came out and he was like uh, he was like yeah we were gonna put this on PlayStation but like there were some hiccups with me being um, an Oculus employee where they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to deal with that. And so I was like, well, maybe I can do it. And he's like, yeah, that'd be great. And so um, basically I've been taking his game and porting it to PS4 for the past few months. Um, so, um, did we get some audio out of that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. Mm -mm. So.
No! No chainsaws? So it's not like, um, it, I wouldn't call it a true like horror game, and it's not like Resident Evil or or like uh, Soma or any of those like just blow your mind ones. It's more of like a creepy game, but I still like I won't play those games. <laughs> so it's been kind of hard to make a thing that's like scary. <laughs> like, I, I I'll be completely honest. I like did not play the full game through for as long as I possibly could hold out, and then I was like, and I have a tester, so I would just like keep sending it to him. Be like, yeah, it looks good. And he he just got totally sick of playing. But eventually, I needed to play it through, and and uh, it wasn't that bad. It was it was actually good, kind of scary. Um, but yeah, if I'm working out late at night, I'll I'll play in TV mode and not VR mode. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I've mainly just been uh, working through all the stuff to get it onto the platform, and most of the stuff that's hard about it is is really um, Sony's a lot harder about uh, permitting VR fails. Essentially, you actually have to run it through something called VR Console where. They make sure that it runs at frame rate and that it like doesn't do anything bad, and so you just kind of have to pass all these things. And then they're a lot stricter in terms of um, your game just has to be a lot more polished. So I just had to clean up a lot of stuff. So it's kind of sucked uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways, but it's also been good, like because um, you know being a PS4 developer is not everybody is that, so it's like a good business thing too. So um, so it was a kind of a good little palate cleanser after. Had master before I like started a new thing, um, and then why? While, while I had the room, I wanted to ask if anybody. Okay, so I had this idea today, and I wanted to know if anybody knows about this. So um, I was thinking about the next game to do, and just as a little side project. And you guys know what idle games are. I know there was a, uh, one of the guys here made that awesome sword fighting game. Yeah. Um, that wasn't any of you that's actually. It's here. not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I loved how that went. Like it seemed like he got a lot of play. But is anybody like familiar with that genre at all? Like, yeah. Okay. So I was thinking about, it, uh, is, is anybody else familiar with Ben and Foddy's Getting Over It? That just came out, the game about like you're supposed to, you're like oh, in a pot, yeah, yeah. you're in a pot, you need to, like, and I was thinking idle games are like meant to be like you play them and forget about them and it, like you keep doing better. But I was wondering if there was a, a way of flipping that where like um, it was an idle game, but it was actually it was like an endurance challenge. And the way that the mechanic would go was that it started out and you had to do something like for like on a high frequency, but then like over time, the amount of time that you needed to do the thing like extended. But if you didn't do it, then the game would be over. <laughs> and so like it was like one second, one second, two seconds, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then it's like you start to be like, I think I can walk away. And you come back and it's like, you know, 10 minutes later and it's like 20 minutes later. And it's like, how long do you want to keep the plate spinning for? But your interaction <laughs> only has to come at like increasing intervals to the point where you're increasing it to like, you don't have to come back for six hours. And you're like, I think I can go to work. You know, I think I can come back to work and do the thing. And you're like, I think I can go to work again. Oh, I think I can go on a trip. Oh, I think I can go on vacation. Oh, I don't even need to think about this until like, you know, next week or something, it just keeps going up, and then there's like an online leaderboard where there's people that are just like, how long have they been able to keep the game going? And I was wondering if anybody's ever heard of something like that. No, but how could you do that to society? Not many people yes. would not go to work. Well, it, <laughs> you're gonna have to be your kids. <laughs> right, right. So, so it would be like, who's? But then maybe it would just become trivial, and there would just be thousands of people who have it, all have it going, and there's no reason that it ever stops. So I don't know if there needs to be some additional layer of like, it gets harder or. It seems like that also kind of flattens out. Like you get right. to the point where, well, that's the last click, and now it won't right. stop until I'm dead. Yes. <laughs> Right, maybe the design makes that idea is flawed. So. <laughs> so what about what about rewards though, right? Like, the, the longer you go, the fewer there are of you. I think right? it's a great Twitch game. Right, if there's like... People play it on... You start, oh, you know, Twitch, you know, many, many people play it for a okay. or two minutes. And now then it's not it's like a fun person, right? Right, yeah, right, right, right. That's right. the idea, right. is that it should like... And, but I think you're right that it would... It might flatten to the point of, tri of being trivial. 
So you need to figure out a way like, okay, how do you keep it from being trivial? Like maybe every time you come back, the challenge is actually a, is, gets harder, but you have longer to, to like figure it out. I don't know. But. Uh, you make it multiplayer. Have you seen the story on that? Doesn't do it. That's what I'm saying on Twitch. Oh, like it's got like you pass. Oh. Oh. Like I pass to Shane. Shane oh. pass. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Oh, pass is good. Because it's not. How long it's not on you. It going yeah, in between. between. You involve other people, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. There's an yeah, interesting so article that came out. I just said on the ten thousand year clock. I don't know if you've seen it. So this is Dan Hillis, who designed the connection machine back at MIT. <laughs> he got 42 million of funding from Jeff Bezos, but he'd been looking at like things that expand over time. The idea is to design a clock that lasts 10,000 years. Yeah. So what they're doing is like the, the clock does something every day, and it's a different sound every day. And then they have like a room that something's going to happen after it's been going one year. And then they have another room for 10 years. And then they have another room for 100 years. Now, this is physical on the side of a mountain in North Carolina. And then they have the 1,000-year room, and then they have the 10,000-year room. Mm -hmm. And they're only building out the rooms for one in 10 years, and they're leaving the building the other stuff for future generations. Mm -hmm. So if you can take your game, which is longer and longer and longer, and other people can figure out what's going to happen right. with the number of people that reach that all at the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't know right. how that... There does seem like a relation there. Like there should be sure. greater and greater like rewards for the longer you run. I feel like you're going to yeah. fall into like the Peter Molyneux trap with something like that <laughs> where you build up the hype to such a huge degree where people are like what's inside the box what's inside the box and then when they actually open the box it's like oh that was disappointing oh, yeah so you <laughs> right, push sure. the box sure. <laughs> so, you. so i i will yield but that that's kind of what i i and then i'm going to uh the game developers conference in a few weeks i i'm gonna actually give a talk that was sponsored for I use a source control that's a little weird called Plastic SCM. Um, it's kind of like a hybrid between Perforce and Git. And they asked me if I wanted to speak of because I actually like it, like even though I'm gonna like get, you know, some what benefits for speaking. Sorry? What day is that? Wednesday between two and three. So the talk is called Remote Unity Studio in a Box. So it's like basically everything I did to form Frame Interactive, like all the little bits that I pulled in, so it's like, if you wanted to scale from one to more than one, like, how would you do it? And it's kind of like the methodology, essentially it's like, how to pipe every single thing you do into Slack. <laughs> it's kind of like how I, how I think of it, but, um, yeah, so. It's just called what? One it's two, called one. Remote Unity Studio in a Box. Yeah, it's, 